message and for next Sunday, I know is a little bit of a strange title, Stay in the Fire. It doesn't sound like that's something we would really want to do, you know, especially when raising our children. You know what that was like. So, But I'm gonna, uh, I want you to pay close attention to some scripture we're going to read from God's Word. And we're going to talk about this for the next couple of weeks to get acquainted with a few words that help, will help us to get the most out of our Christian walk with the Lord. In Exodus 3, it says there, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Reading further in the same book, book of Exodus, chapter 30, it says, Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lamps. He must burn incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight, so incense will burn regularly. Say regularly. It's a very important word. Before the Lord for the generations to come. And then in Leviticus 6.13, it says, the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. Must not go out. Must not go out. Why? Well, look at that. There was a reason for all of this to be said in Scripture. There's lessons to be learned, not just a practice for the Israelites, but a lesson to be learned for all of us. By way of introduction, though, it does seem strange to fulfill a request to stay in the fire when it goes against common sense <laughs> of a literal fire. I know when we were growing up, we were, we'd be told by mom and dad, don't, don't play with matches, don't play with fire. Now they're in heaven, I can say this, I did. <laughs> On occasion, it was normal as a kid to play with fire and see what you could do with it. But we were taught that not to do that, and you teach your children to not to play with fire, because we know the dangers of it. But there is a fire in the Bible that we need to be in, that we need to be a part of. It's a different kind of fire, as our scripture shared with us and showed us. This was a fire that got Moses' attention. Keep that thought in mind. A fire that got Moses' attention. So we have a big question to answer today and next Sunday. We hope it will be of great value to your walk with the Lord. And, and that is, and I, I will say I've not heard it worded this way, but I hear it said in other ways. And it's this. Why the roller coaster Christian experience? Why the roller coaster Christian experience? Why is it, Pastor, that I'm up one moment, but I'm down the next? Why is it that I can feel God so much one moment and just don't feel God at all the next? Why is it, Pastor, that I can experience such a, a move of God's Spirit at one time, and then before you know it, I'm down in the dumps and I'm struggling? I'm struggling. What happened to those moments when I wasn't struggling? Why does it seem to dissipate? Why does it seem to go away? Why is it sometimes, Pastor, that I feel like my prayers go nowhere? As the phrase would be said over the years growing up, I would hear people say, well, my prayers didn't go any higher than the ceiling. They just felt like they didn't leave the room. They just stayed there having a hard time thinking that God is hearing the prayers, hearing my prayer, hearing my cry. Why does it seem like that, that it doesn't go anywhere? Now, 
I want to pause for a moment and have you think about this question. Have you ever stopped to notice when you pray or reach out to God? Have you ever noticed what it is or when is it that we do that? Stop and think about when is the normal time that we do call on God versus when we don't. Most of the time, not all the time, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with doing it at this time, but we tend in human nature to limit it to only this time, and that's this, when we need something. When we need something. When something urgent has happened, we find ourselves immediately calling out to God, immediately wanting to get in the presence of God, immediately wanting to get help and hear from the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do. It's a good thing to do. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and help in a time of need, Hebrews 4, 16. So the Bible actually encourages to come before him in a time of need. Nothing wrong with that. But that tends to be a routine for most believers that that gets to be the only time they do. They're not thinking of that enduring, ongoing approach and giving attention to God. That's not in thought processes as it could be. So, Pastor, am I not supposed to feel God all the time? Isn't something wrong if I don't? And the answer to that is not necessarily, but it could be. But not necessarily. Because the just shall live by faith. Didn't say by feeling. It said we will live by faith. So there's, there are going to be times that we're not going to always feel the exuberance in the presence of God. We're not going to always feel that. But that doesn't mean he isn't still there. Now, here's a question. Listen carefully. But am I there in his presence? See? Am I present in his presence? Is my mind stayed on him? He said that he would give perfect peace to whose minds are stayed on him. Sometimes that peaceless feeling we have, that, that un nerving feeling we have about where's God it, it, it could really be that his presence is there but we're not in his presence we're not there like we need to be or should be or could be and I, I'm sure that you can think of other scenarios why that might be and why there might be a roller coaster experience and again it's not like you know I've had people tell me every week Pastor, why do I have a roller coaster experience? But I hear enough to know that that scenario is being lived out in their lives, and there's this up and down feeling, this up and down thing. And Pastor, I just want it to be steady. I just want it to be ongoing. I just want it to be every, just always there, always in that sense. So in my devotions, I came to an epiphany. <laughs> I thought, I thought it was so important. I actually put the word epiphany in your outline, huh? Epiphany. The word epiphany has a lot of different definitions, but basically when I say epiphany, I'm referring to coming to an awareness of something. Something that just hits you. It just comes to light. It's like, whoa, the light bulb comes on. And I want you to think about something. This is very, very important to this thought today about the presence of God. Very important. It's this. Every time I'm pulled in another direction in my life, that means I'm steered away from the direction I was going. Every time I'm pulled in another direction in life, I'm being steered away from the direction I was going. So here was my epiphany. <laughs> Trying to explain how we can conquer this up and down, up and down, up and down scenario. And it's this. I cannot go. It's so simple. I cannot go in two directions at the same time. Brother Mike, would you come down here, please? 
And just stand right in front of me right here. Okay, just stand right here. Now, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to walk that direction for me. Okay? All right, you may stop. Now, I want you to turn around and I want you to walk in this direction. All right, thank you. Now, do you know that when you walked that way, you departed from this direction? Do you know that when you walked this way, you departed from that direction? So come here, I want you to stay in the middle again. Now, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to walk in two directions at the same time. You can't do it? The guy in the last service went like this. He didn't know, he didn't know what to do. All right, thanks, Mike. I, I, I just wanted you to see a simple, simple, simple visual. Now, apply that spiritually. In my life, when I leave here today, I'm going to walk in a direction. I'm going to live a direction. I'm going to talk a direction. I'm going to think a direction. I'm, I'm just going to conduct myself in the direction. But when I go in the direction I go, know this, I'm going away from another direction in my life. So here's another question, very important. Is God welcomed in the direction I'm going daily in my life? Is God welcomed to go in the same direction that I'm walking in life. Is this, please, does this please God? Is this what God wants? Would God be, you know, we talk about walking in agreement with God, but we never stop to think about, but what about God walking in agreement with us? I might like to think he's in agreement with how I'm walking, how I'm living, how I'm thinking, how I'm talking, but is God welcomed does he feel welcomed in that scenario? Does he feel welcomed in that? How, how is God responding to that? I need to know that, don't I? Now, <clears throat> this is where things begin to get a little challenging because there's a difference between being in God's presence and experiencing the manifestation, the moving of God's spirit. There is a difference. Because I believe, first of all, that we're all in the presence of God because the Bible says that God is, uh, is omnipotent. He's all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, and he is everywhere at the same time. So God is everywhere at the same time. He's omnipresent. So as much as God is right here today, he's in Africa, where, by the way, one of our Assemblies of God pastors in five of his congregation were killed by the terrorist this week. And we need to lift up this church in Africa where this is happening. And it's not just the Assemblies of God, but it's all kinds of churches that are being attacked. We are experiencing closer to home than ever a modern day persecution against the church. And so we need to prepare ourselves but the same God that's here in this service today is the same God that's in that church in Africa where they lost their people. That pastor was there for 40 years. They took his life, his son's life, and some other members of the church. In our passage of our scripture that we read today, and we will talk more about this next week, there were four things that we needed to note. So I, I am touching on some for next week, and that's okay. This is uh, a busy weekend, and our attendance is down because people have to report, I guess, to their race track, even though this may not be a race. They still have to report. <laughs> uh, they do. A lot of our workers have to report to the race track, and a lot of uh, our people are involved in the working of a race. So they're not with us today. But when Moses saw the bush burning, he thought, I'll go over, four things, I'll go over and see it. It got his attention. I'll go see it. Number two, the Lord saw that he had gone over. It says that. We read that. The Lord saw that he had gone over. 
And as a result, say result. This is important. Say result. As a result, God called to him. Now, when he was over there observing the bush there, there was no interaction. It wasn't until Moses approached the bush and got into the presence and the closest of the bush that God spoke to him. When I leave here today, church, I can't be out there doing my own thing, be distant from God, and expect to hear God speak. It's only as I leave her today that I also say also that I also am approaching God and to be in his presence that I'm going to hear from God. I can't go my own direction, do my own thing, unless it is a, approved by God to do what I'm doing, biblically approved, and expect to hear from God. I'm not going to do it. Hence, I open the door to this kind of relationship. It's up and down, in and out. But number four, here's what was so beautiful. Moses didn't say, here I am over here. It's when he got near God's presence and approached the, approached, approached, approached the burning bush that he heard from God and he responded to God in obedience and said, here I am. Then we know the story. If you don't, then you need to read that story in the, for the sake of time today. Uh, it wasn't long that, you know, we got the Ten Commandments, we got the directions, we got how we're supposed to live. He, God spoke to Moses. God prepared Moses. It's a whole other series. But why did this happen? Because Moses approached the bush. He approached God, where he then learned God's, where God's, and who God's, and what is God's presence. And it changed his direction. It changed his direction by going the direction that God sent us. So, you want an epiphany? Here it is. If I walk away from the presence because of whatever... I've changed direction and I can't walk in two, or excuse me, English teachers, I cannot walk in two different directions at the same time. It will not happen. Try it. You know, you've heard the phrase sitting on the fence, trying to make a decision which way to go. And you've heard me say off and on over the years, our goal as a Christian is not to see how close we can get to the fence in the world and still be a Christian, but how far away from the fence in the world can I go and be the Christian God wants me to be. That's the, that's the challenge that we need to think about. This sitting on the fence, teeter toning back and forth, deciding yes, no, yes, no, is not, that's, here we go. You can't go two directions at the same time. You got to make up my mind, your mind. I got to make up my mind what direction I'm going to go, what direction I'm going to pursue. To experience the voice of God, to experience the presence of God, to experience the completeness of God, to experience the fulfillment, fulfillment of God, to experience the strength of God, to experience the peace of God, to experience the help of God. I've got to be approaching his direction while still doing the things that I need to do in life to carry on with the responsibilities that I have and you have. Which brings us back again. The other question, is he welcomed in the direction I'm going in my daily life? Is he welcomed? Now, the scripture we started off with is the secret to this question of being on a roller coaster ride in our Christianity and to see that, guess where we're going to visit again? Yep, going back to the garden. Do you know, it's got to be one of the most preached on books and uh, stories in the Bible for decades. 
because it all started in the garden. It did. The good we have came from God. That came from God. That came in the garden. The bad that we have in this world also came from the garden. So good and bad came from the garden. God is good and mankind was bad. The enemy is bad. It all started there. The choice that Adam and Eve made that dreadful day took them in a different direction. Took them in a, a different direction where God's presence was no longer being felt. The anticipation that God was going to visit them in the cool of the day, the anticipation of that or the joy of that, we weren't there. We don't know if it was ever, we don't know, we don't know. It's not written, but we know that in this particular day, he had come to visit them. You have to believe that with his creation, he did this all the time. How else would we think that? It's hard to believe that one time in the entire existence, he only visited them one time. No, he created them for fellowship. He created them for relationship, for connection. We talked about that. This is primary with God. This is a preeminent issue with God. It took him in a different direction. They took him away from the presence of God that they no longer felt. At least not at, for that given day and moment in time. Because Genesis 3.8, buried in that verse, it says, they hid from the Lord God. We're so funny as humans. Have you ever said this to somebody? You know, I, I, I want to say something out loud, but I'm afraid if I do, God will hear me and I'm in trouble. I, 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 I tease my wife sometimes. I'll say, hey, honey, I'm going to tell you something, but don't tell God I told you. <laughs> I'm just having fun with her. We get a chuckle at all that. And, but think about something. We do. I, I've known people. They, in, in all sincerity, they've actually said, well, I, I want to say something, but if I do, I'm afraid God, I'm told God if, if he hears me say this. And I have to remind them, well, according to Psalms, <laughs> 139, David said, Lord, you know every word on my tongue before any of them are spoken. <laughs> Folks, he knows your thoughts. He knows my thoughts. And if I said it in my head, I might as well say it out loud. <laughs> so I can hear what it sounds like because I said it in my head. And if I'm going to get convicted for saying it out loud, I'm going to get convicted for saying it in my mind. God's going to keep us on track here. <laughs> but it's true. They hid from the Lord. Why did they go a different direction? Why did they hide from the Lord? Because they broke the law. They broke the guidance. They broke the rule. They broke the, the, what God set up for them and, and what he knew was best for them. And they disobeyed God. And they sinned as a result. They disobeyed God. The, the worst thing that could happen after the fall, really, the worst thing that could happen outside of the fall when it happened was to be dismissed from the presence of God. That was as bad as the sin that was committed. To have his presence depart from us. Now, don't get confused theologically because his presence is everywhere at all times. But he can withdraw his manifest, his manifest presence. He can withdraw that extra moving of his spirit from us because we've walked away from the extra moving of his spirit. We walked away from it. By the choices we made. You know what the worst thing about hell is? And there is a hell. Despite what you're hearing today in Christendom, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And the Bible makes that very clear. All a person has to do is read the Bible. And the Bible will straighten out all of these crazy notions out there that hell's on earth, we're experiencing hell now. Just read the Bible and the Bible couldn't be more clear. I love it when people know the Bible better than you do and they've never even read the book. <laughs> Have no clue. 
Don't put me in charge of NASA. I haven't read the books. But people become experts on the Bible who admit they've never read the Bible. Read the Bible. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And the worst thing about hell isn't just the torment and the pain and the agony of the eternal fire. And there is eternal fire. The Bible says so. And it's not symbolic. There's evidence that it's legitimately real in Scripture. Now, don't get saved to avoid hell. Get saved to have a relationship with Jesus. But in getting a relationship with Jesus, you're going to avoid hell. But you know what? (laughs) That was so cute. Oh, (laughs) you're getting it, young one. (laughs) You're getting it. Now, listen, the worst part about hell is absolute separation from God for eternity. That is the most agonizing thing about hell because you will be totally saved. Do you know it's been predicted that if God ever removed his presence from the earth, that the earth would be bedlam overnight. That his power, his presence is the restraining, one of the, one of the restraining forces that keeps this universe from collapsing, this earth from collapsing, this earth from going berserk. Is the very presence of his presence in our earth. And you know what? Why would we not believe that? Because if we're not in the presence of God, look how ugly we feel. Look how uncomfortable we feel. Look how distant we feel. Well, Adam and Eve wanted to hide from this beautiful manifestation of God's presence, walking in the cool of the day, the Bible says, to connect with him. It's very bad to withdraw from the presence, his presence, but it's worse if he withdraws his known presence from us. So next week, we're going to take a look at why we need his presence and the practical aspects of walking in his presence. Be very practical. So in conclusion for this morning, the story goes... And I apologize if I don't have the exact wording, but I do have the exact application of the story, okay? But the story goes that a, a pastor went to visit one of his prisoners who had been absent from church. And he went to visit him, and the, as I recall the story more of Pastor Ryan than what we talked about, it started coming back to me. The prisoner was debating with the pastor that he didn't need to be in church. And believe me, folks, we do not espouse that it's all about Sunday morning, what we espouse at Calvary, that it's seven days a week. But we celebrate on Sunday. And we need to be here to celebrate on Sunday because it encourages each other. It, it, it unites us together in unity to care for each other and to reach the lost. And so the pastor was debating with him. He said, I don't feel like I need to be in church. Well, as the pastor sitting there, he noticed that the gentleman has a fire. So he gets up and he walks over to the fire, the, the wood that's burning. And he takes the prongs and he reaches in and he takes a piece of the wood, amber, and he sets it to the side away from the other. And he goes back and sits down. So, as they continue the conversation, at some point, you know, the pastor kind of just sits back, lays back, kind of shuts it down a little bit because he's not getting anywhere. And so, he, he looks over at the amber that has finally gone out, and he told his friend, he said, you see that amber that I moved from the fire? Yeah. Is it burning anymore? No. He said, that's what's going to happen to you if you don't stay in the fire. Stay, folks in the fire. Stay in the presence of God. Approach the presence of God. Give attention this week to the presence of God. In your work, give attention. In your pleasure, give attention. If you're on vacation, oh, by all means, give them them attention. I've seen people go on vacation and they took a vacation from God, not just from work. 
And they come back and God gets saved again. Now, what in the world did you do on vacation? You lost your salvation that quick and you have to get saved again or something? What's going on? I've seen people actually have less interest in God after vacation. Like, what did you guys do? They, and you know what? They were good people. This is a true story. They were good people. They just got so busy having fun, they didn't take time with God. Don't be an amber that's set aside from the body of Christ. Don't burn out like that. Because it's far more than just coming to church. But it's every day of the week. And if we don't know the Lord today, you want to cry out to the Lord. You want to say, Lord, forgive me my sins. I want you. I want you. I want. I'm going to be connected to you. I want to be connected to you. We have a funeral here today, 2 o'clock. And uh, uh, I, I say that for two reasons. We do need to... Uh, this is terrible to say, but we do need to hurry you along so we can get things ready for the service. Um, but at that service and at all the funeral services, I give an altar call. I give an altar call. I don't play on the emotions of the people, but we have to be honest with them. One day they could be there. And the question is, are we ready? Are we ready? So today, invite Jesus in your heart. Let us know. Meanwhile, when we leave her today, let us walk toward the presence of God in all, say all, all. that we do. Just, just don't forget. Let's not forget who we serve. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I do want to tell you that, you know, I had a service on, a funeral service on, uh, I guess it was Monday or Tuesday. And we have had quite a few this year. And I want to give you some good news. When we do a prayer of, of, in, in the, at the funeral service, we do hear people praying to accept the Lord. So God does use even a funeral service to bring people to him. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, most gracious Heavenly Father, we need your presence and we need to be in your presence and we need to answer that question. Are you welcome to where I go? Do you feel welcome to where I go? Do you feel welcome in what I say? Do you feel welcome in what I think? I could be distancing you and myself if I'm not in line with your word, that's important. And walk in obedience. The way to avoid it, and it doesn't mean that we won't have challenges in our Christian walk. But it can mean that if we stay in your presence, we have the strength to go through those times without going up and down, up and down, up and down. One minute we love you, next minute we're mad at you. One minute we, we're excited about you, next minute we at where in the world were you, God? You know what, Lord? It's not where you were, where was I? Before that even happened, where was I? Was I in your presence before that hard time came? Was I in your presence? Was I in your word? Was I in your will before that hard time hit me in my life? Lord, it wasn't until Moses approached the bush did he hear from you. Let's approach you this week so we can hear from you. We commit ourselves to you afresh and anew. We know you're present everywhere, but we want to experience that moving of your spirit. Lord, so many times we leave a church, we say, boy, didn't God move by his spirit today? And the answer to that is, well, he's always moving by his spirit. It's that we decided to move with you. We simply decided to move with you. You've always been moving by your spirit. In fact, you're waiting for us to move with you. So grant it, we pray, Lord. And we'll give you the glory. And we'll give you the honor. And all God's people prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. Go in his presence.